Live, brought to you from the Eternal Word Television Studios in Birmingham, Alabama. Network is built on trust. The essence of evangelization is to tell everybody Jesus loves you. We are all called to be great saints. Don't miss the opportunity. Thank you. And we are going to talk about Jesus tonight because he's the best one to talk about. You know, I thought tonight we would talk how our dear Lord loved poor sinners. Now, we're all sinners. There are only one, Our Lady and Our Lord Himself, who were not sinners. They came among us. Our dear Lady was to be the Mother of God, so she was conceived immaculate. And our dear Lord was divine, and so he never sinned. He was like unto us and everything except sin. So, so the rest of us are why he came. So I want to talk uh, particularly to all of you out there who have not been to confession in a long time. I want to talk to you. Unfortunately, there's a lot of people who have not been to confession in a long time because they can't find a confessor. They go from city to city looking for someone who believes in sin and hell. And if you don't believe in sin and hell, you're like a runaway horse. So you're going to do what you please, when you please, but somewhere, somewhere, you're going to stop. You're going to hit a wall, a wall, and there's no place to go. You want to go back, and there's another place to go. And that's where some of you tonight are listening to me. And the reason you don't go to confession is because you're afraid. You're afraid. Of what? Of what? If you're not afraid to sin before the very eyes of God, why are you afraid to go to confession? I think some people think when they go to confession, God heard it the first time. <laughs> no, no, he saw it the first time. You're not telling him anything he doesn't already know. He just wants you to be sorry. See? There's a big difference, huh? I'm going to read a few passages here. That I'm going to look at. It says, while he was at dinner in the house, it happened that a number of tax collectors, even today nobody likes a tax collector, <laughs> Things haven't changed. I feel sorry for them. They can't help at their job to, uh, let me say a word to tax collect. I can't help it. You know, it's just a wonderful opportunity to say something to tax collectors. If you're not like, let me tell you one reason why you're not liked. Sometimes you'll pick out somebody, some innocent old guy from a, a, a whole list of names and you'll investigate him, ask him where he put all this money, what he did with it, did he really give it to charity? And then you let abortion doctors who work in abortion clinics who are paid cash 
Have you ever investigated that? I bet you haven't. Have you ever wondered how many people go in there at $400 each time and go out? Where is that money? Why don't you investigate that and leave these little people alone? They're doing anything. Working hard to make a living. Why don't you try it? But even you, <laughs> God loves <laughs> he loves you. And what does he say here? Okay? It says, He came to sit at the table with Jesus and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, oh, he said, Why does your master eat with tax collectors and sinners? I thought it was interesting they separated sinners from tax collectors. Did give the impression. <laughs> Did you think that was interesting? I thought they were sinners too. Must be a special sin to be a tax collector. <laughs> <laughs> oh, am I in trouble? <laughs> okay. When he heard this, Jesus replied, it's not the healthy who needs a doctor, but the sick. Oh, all you liberals out there listening to me. What would you do if I called all sinners sick? Ooh, I can just feel it coming through the TV. But Jesus called sinners sick. And he said, go and learn what the word says, that what I want is mercy, not sacrifice. Indeed, I did not come to call the virtuous, but sinners. Now look at that, Jesus is calling you tonight. Somebody there sitting in a living room right now with his feet propped up, drinking a beer. <laughs> I'd straighten up if I were you. <laughs> I would. The Lord's looking for you. Now, they couldn't understand why he could eat with sinners because sinners were outcasts. A sinner in those days, who someone was not a Jew, he was a Gentile, or he didn't observe all the laws. But there were so many laws you couldn't observe, you couldn't even remember what they were. Now, it says here, he says, I have come to call sinners. God calls you tonight. He calls you to trust him, to trust in his mercy. You know, we, we kind of fear God for the wrong reasons. Um, a sinner will think, well, my soul is so heavy with sin, and God is so holy. Both are true. God is awesomely holy majestically holy. And we are sinners, poor sinners. And, and we have a hard time. You see, we have the impression, and it's the wrong impression, that I cannot get close to such a holy being. And that's what keeps you from confession, you see. It's a false humility. We used to call it humility with a hook. You know what that is? Humility with a hook? You don't know? Let's see. Uh, let's say you did something very, you made a beautiful painting, and you put it just at the right spot where everybody would see it. And somebody comes in and says, Oh! That's beautiful. 
and you say, nah, it's not beautiful. I, oh, yeah, it's beautiful. No, nah, I just kind of slopped it together. I, meantime, you're pulling it closer and closer, you see. Why is that with a hook? Because you want that person to say five times, oh, it's beautiful. So you come on with all this, nah, it's just a little thing I did while I was sleeping one night. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> it's really nothing. You know, I could do it with one hand tied in back of me. See, all that, is, it looks a little bit like humility, but it's no good. No good. I think that's how we are with God sometimes, you see. We say, oh, Lord, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not good enough to, to, to be holy. I'm not good enough to, be, to go to confession and be forgiven. I mean, you know, you don't really know me. Oh, listen, he knows you. I think I told you this before, but it bears telling at this point. The man came to me. I said, oh, you gone to church? He said, nah. He said, I don't go to Mass. He said, I don't go with all those hypocrites. I thought one more it won't hurt. <laughs> we we excuse ourselves, you see, and sometimes we're even angry over a big sinner who repents. I've told you that a hundred times. We just don't want to say, look at him up there going to communion. I knew when he did this. We have an aversion for goodness. We even do it ads now. People put up aspirin, Tylenol, Advil, and they'll say, all of these, you see all of these? They're no good. You gotta buy mine. <laughs> that's, that's what I call dirty advertising, you know? Why do you have to lower somebody to pull yourself up? And we do this with confession. We'll see somebody or hear someone who really did a lot of things that were no good, and suddenly they have a conversion. And you hear people say, oh, that hypocrite. Why, what hypocrite? He knows he was wrong. He's saying he was wrong, and he's repenting because he's wrong. Why is it you and I, as Christians, have a hard time accepting a conversion experience. You know what it means to save souls, huh? It means that I love sinners, I know they're sinners, God knows they're sinners, but God and I want to bring them back into his heart. Oh. What a wonder, huh? <coughs> That's something awesome. We get letters every day of whole families coming back to the church. And somebody will say, inevitably, I was out of the church 30, 35 years, but I saw you pointing your finger at me when it ran the show, and you said, go to confession. And I went. <laughs> now, isn't that wonderful? You got to scare people sometimes. There is a hell. I read where the Episcopal Church just decided there was no hell. <laughs> I hope they don't mind that hot stuff. <laughs> you cannot say there is no hell when the Lord God talks about it all the time. <laughs> See, you get the impression that even people in the church don't want people to be converted. They don't want to be saved. They don't want anybody to go from an awfully evil life to an awesomely holy life. We read about uh, St. Augustine. Oh, isn't that a wonderful story, huh? How he got converted. Whew. He did everything a man could possibly do that was wrong. Now, we rejoice over someone that gets converted in the third century. And we're angry over someone that gets converted in the 20th century. 
I think that's kind of odd. I had a takeoff on David the other day. It's a lesson. <laughs> the son of David. Jesus was known as son of David. A holy man. He wrote the most beautiful psalms. And he was a holy man. But he looked out the wrong window at the wrong time. <laughs> He should have turned around, but he didn't. After that, he connived to get the poor woman's wife, her husband killed in battle. Was he through? No, he fell again. How? He took a census. And, and the generals of the army went to us and said, Your Majesty, please don't take the census. No, I'm going to take the census. I want to see how many people I have. Whoa, whoa. All right, he got greatly punished for that. And then when the poor man was old, and he was lying there dying, and he wanted to build a temple for the Lord. And the Lord said to Nathan, no, he cannot build a temple for me. He's built too much blood. And yet he was beloved of God. Why? <clears throat> because David knew what he sinned. He was awesomely repentant when he sinned. He took his penance like a man with humility of heart and hope in his mind. See? And God the Father loved David. Look at Moses. Moses was known in the scriptures as the most gentle of men. And yet before he ran away from Egypt, he killed, let's say, who had killed another Jew. And he was so angry when he saw the people reveling and sinning and uh, worshiping a golden calf that he threw down the tablets that God made. And he had to go all the way back up the mountain, fast another 40 days and 40 nights to get those Ten Commandments back again. And then as he went along, there came a time when the people were thirsty again. And he, instead of hitting the rock once, he hit it twice. And he said, am I supposed to bring water out of this rock? Whoa. He had already done that. He should have never questioned God's power. He was a holy man. But for a moment, he lost it. But he was repentant. Sorry, and the Lord said, because of this, you shall not enter the promised land. I, you shall see it from afar, but you shall not enter. And he took his chastisement like a man in humble obedience. So you see all these great men, like you and me, we're sinners. Unlike the rest of us, they knew when they sinned, they said they sinned, they were awesomely repentant, and they did their penance bravely. And they went back loving the Lord with their whole heart, mind, and soul. What an example we have of deep repentance. You should never, never, never be discouraged. A lot of you out there have had 
One, two, three abortions for some as many as nine. I know you're afraid. Don't be afraid. Be brave. Kneel down and say, Jesus, I am sorry. So sorry. And I want to come back to you. I want to serve you. I want to be holy. And go to confession. What a... You know, our Lord said one time, he said, there is more joy in heaven when one sinner repents. Oh, could you... Some of you have a, the angels would have a ball. <laughs> I could just see him up there saying, why don't we pick on that one? <laughs> we could have a feast for seven days. <laughs> if we would just repent. You know, our dear Lord gave us an example one time of the prodigal son. Remember that, huh? You've heard it a thousand times. Most of us, though, put ourselves on the other side of the, the other son's side, the good one, who never left home and worked hard all day long and always said yes to his dad. Wonderful. And this went out and spent all his inheritance in, in debauchery and drinking. And when he got to a place that nobody wanted him or would even give him a husk from the swine, he decided to go home. All he wanted was to be a servant. He never asked to be a son again. But the Eternal Father is, gave you an example of himself. He, he put a robe on him, he gave him a ring, and he cut, he killed the fatted calf, had a big feast. Wouldn't you like that to happen tomorrow if you went to confession? Not only will they rejoice in heaven, but you will rejoice because you're home again. You're home again. You don't know what that means. Because you've been out of the Father's house a long time. But you're home now. What a wonderful thing to be home. Some of you out in the cold a couple of weeks ago, huh? Thought you'd never get home. Then you went through ice and snow and you were shivering and cold and finally you saw that one house that's yours. Do you remember that feeling? Well, the one you're going to get if you go to confession is much better than that one. I think we all need to look at the Eternal Father I know when you read the Old Testament, you get the impression, you know, that the Eternal Father is kind of hard on everybody. Well, he had to be with their stiff-necked people. He called them stiff-necked, stubborn. Ooh. But he did send his son. And he did so many wonderful things for them. For one thing, for you and I, he created us. It was the mind of the Eternal Father that decided you and I would be. Here we are in this studio looking at each other, enjoying the Lord. But it was the mind of the Eternal Father that before time began saw you, the possibility of you being born and said, yes, this one shall be. That's you. 
It's so, so bad to feel you're useless or to feel that you're not worth anything or to feel you've done all you can now. And it's so useless because society does that to all of us. It used to be you retired at 72, then they made it 62. Now they're pushing to the 55 as if, well, long enough for you, buddy. You give 30 years to your company, you're about to retire. <coughs> See, we've come so far away from God. We're on the level of survival of the fittest. Let me tell you, in the eyes of God, it's the sick, the crippled, the blind, the deaf, those who cannot speak, those who have known nothing but poverty and suffering and pain their whole life. They are very special to God. And you can't write them off. And because we're not a repentant people, we have become hard. Now, I understand all the bishops in France, is that right? Decided that condoms were okay, you're going to, you're going to protect society from AIDS. What school did you graduate from? Kindergarten. You know what protects people from AIDS? Chastity. Are we afraid to say that? very disheartening when a whole group of bishops don't know that. Let me, let me show you a little, little thing I read here. This is another unrepentant here. I won't tell you where it's from. You might guess so. Here's a new description of Eucharist. What is the Eucharist? No, not what, who? The body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus. I will not leave you orphans. Well, let me show you what this bright young man said. He was all tired and sweaty, pushing his homemade cart down the alley, stopping now and then. I wanted to tell him about Eucharist. But the look in his eyes was despair and hopelessness. And so I just said hi and gave him Eucharist. Why don't you buy him a hamburger? <laughs> Downtown is nice. The lights changed from red to green and back again flashing blues and pinks. I gulped them in and said, thank you, Father, and made them Eucharist. Can you believe what you're hearing? I laughed at myself and told myself, you're, you, with all your sin and all your selfishness, I forgive you, I accept you, I love you, and I gave myself Eucharist. Eucharist is as simple as being on time, as profound as sympathy. When I give you my supper, when I give you me, I give you Eucharist. If there was a life of the year, this would make it. See, you need to go to confess why. If you believe this, you have to admit, I have lost my faith in the real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist. 
So you, we don't even, if you breathe this trash here, you, you don't even believe now. You're not a Catholic anymore. Huh? And we have so many burdens on our back that we don't even know when we sin. And so you need to go to confession. And just pour out. You're talking to Jesus. You're not talking to a man. It is the Lord who listens to you. What a wonderful Father we have that he would think of that. That's why you must think of the Eternal Father as the most merciful and the most generous of all fathers. Why? Because he gave you his son. His son, Jesus. I don't know of anybody here or anybody anywhere that would give his only begotten son for people who are so ungrateful. And he suffered so much. We were listening at table today to the life of uh, Padre Pio. A marvelous man. I suffered unbelievably his whole life. But so holy that when you went to confession, if you missed something, he'd say, did you forget something? <laughs> and you'd say, no. Oh, are you sure? Yes. Then come back tomorrow. Wow. A woman went to him one time and, and um, he made her come back three times. And finally, she said the third time, I don't have anything else. And he said, oh, yes, you do. He told her the day and the time she committed an abortion and showed her what that son was destined to be. She, well, you could, you could oh, well, you wish that you had somebody like that. Don't you wish you had somebody like that around? Hmm? They could tell you what you forgot. Because God knows it all. We have no reason to be afraid. Now I'm going to open up for some phone calls because I think some of you have something you want to ask. Hello? Hi. Hey, where are you from? Um, New York. And what is your question? Um, I'd like to have your opinion, Mother. Um, a priest in our parish has told me that we only need to go to confession a few times a year. And I'm used to going every week, and I feel kind of confused because I have great respect for the priest and what I should do because I feel I'm lacking for Jesus. I go every week. Maybe I ought to tell him that. Say, Mother Angelica goes every week. He might say, well, she needs to go every week. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. And that's true. <laughs> Let me tell you something about confession. Confession... For all, most people think you should only go to confession if you have a mortal sin. Right now, if you see anybody going to confessional, you say, Ooh, I wonder what he did. <laughs> <laughs> you can't do that. You can't stigmatize somebody and say, Well, now nobody goes to confession if they have a biggie. <laughs> no, you go to confession not only to a race the bigots, but to erase venial sins. Did you see that dirty movie? No. I thought I saw you walking in there. <laughs> Not me. You lie. 
right, see? And what do you call that? You call it a truth? You can't call it a truth. It's a light. You got to get, this has to, it has to be clean all the time. Now let me tell you about something about confession that's important for you to remember. Confession heals. If I cut myself, whether it's a deep cut or it needs stitches or a small tiny scratch, well, I'm sorry, I did it, right? Cut's still there, scratch is still there. I have to be healed. And confession begins to heal and heal and heal. It takes away the sin, but it's like having flu. Did you ever have flu? And the doctor said, well, you're over it. You say, I am? He said, yeah, no more germs. Oh, you can fool me. What happened? You're tired. The flu, it's over with, it's forgotten. The doctor's on to another patient. You're tired. You're vulnerable. Confession gives you energy, strength, courage, and heals. It heals so what the next time that temptation comes to you or that occasion to lie, you're going to be stronger. You're going to say, yes, I did that. See, confession is so important because it's a healing sacrament. It's a healing. That's why some of you have been away for so many years. Feel feels so good. Do you notice that? You see, I feel like there's a big weight off. You've been healed. Spiritually healed. Your soul is lighter. So please, find another priest. I'd go every week if you can find somebody who understands the soul and the healing we need. We have another call. Hello? Um, yes, Mother. Where are you from? Um, Minnesota. And what is your question? Um, yes, I just came from Mass and communion, uh, and I need your help and prayers, Mother. Um, I had an illness, and I, I can't have children, and I was supposed to be married, and the man now doesn't want me, and I'm, I'm just having trouble dealing with this. I prayed to the Lord and the Holy Mother, and all I really wanted to do was be married and have children, and now I feel... I'm just all alone in the world when all other friends are having children and married and family, and I, I just feel so alone, and I'm having a hard time dealing with it. And I would ask for your prayers and your advice. Thank you, Mother. I feel sorry for that man. The essence of marriage is to have children. But he should have loved you enough. And that's what you really feel, huh? It's not your fault that you cannot have children. But you can always adopt children. You know, you could stop people from having abortions. And, and these children, are, they come into the world and they're alone from day one. And they've been designed by God from all eternity to be, even though the circumstance is not too good. Huh? So you can have children now by giving this pain and suffering for abused children, for aborted children, for children who will never see the light of day because their mothers didn't want them. Pray for them. Give this pain to them and save them. God will send you someone, sweetheart, that will love you for yourself. And then you'll find a baby somewhere that nobody wants. And God will fulfill your, your heart 
And right now you have to find your peace in the permitting will of God. And we'll pray for you. We have another call. Hello? Hi, Mother Angelica. Hi. Where are you from? Pennsylvania. And what is your question? Uh, first of all, I love, I love you dearly, and I pray for all of you every day. Thank you. Second of all, I'm going to hopefully be can. Uh, firm to the Easter Vigil. Wonderful. And I have decided to take the name Angelica. Yay! <laughs> thank you. Thank you, thank you. And my third question, which is very important to me, I have not been able to take communion now since I left the other religion and went into Catholicism till I'm confirmed. Mm hmm well, I you can know. Wait a minute. You don't need to wait till you're confirmed to go to communion. You could go to communion as soon as you're received into the church. Have you been baptized? Yes. Okay. Then I just ask Father to let you allow you to make your first holy communion. Are you under instructions yet? Yes. Okay. Well, he'll tell you the time then when those instructions are finished. You should not have to wait for communion before con confirmation. And sometimes. They come together, but sometimes, you know, somehow I was confirmed before I had my first communion. I think I was uh, five and a half or six when I was confirmed. I think the priest looked in the audience and the congregation, he said, oh, that's going to be a serious one over there. <laughs> we better confirm her first. But that was an, uh, that was an oddity. And then I got my communion a year after. But now it should be that you have your first Holy Communion and then maybe a year later or six months, depending when the bishop comes, you should be confirmed. So you go and ask Father. You've been baptized in the church and there's no reason why. Unless you have some impediment I don't know about. There's no reason why you can't go to communion. We have to look at ourselves, you know, and, and all of us who do go to communion every day, every day, every day, every day. You know, in Holy Father Francis' time, our Holy Mother St. Clair, they only went seven times a year. Ooh. And God bless the Pius X, Pope Pius X, who allowed, who allowed children six and seven years old to make their first communion. I think one of the problems that we have today is we have no sinitis. And some of the catechesis people demand that uh, the children have Holy Communion without confession. Oh, no, 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 no. And our wonderful catechism says every child must go to confession before First Holy Communion. If you're going to treat sex education first, second grade, you better have those kids go to confession. See, we have a big topsy turvy today. We make young kids old before their time. And then we say they have no sin. There's only one immaculate conception. We're born into the world. Many times it's proud, arrogant, selfish. You say, oh, no, well, it proves itself. If you have a child that's even one or two years old and you say, give me a bite. She wasn't trained to do that. I told you about the twins that came in. Their mother came to see me. They had these all-day suckers, you know, these big things like that. And they were licking them like crazy. And this one came up to me and he went like this. Want a lick? It's all sticky, you know? <laughs> and I didn't want to say no. I said, oh, yeah. Look. I gave it back to him. The other one went like this. No way was he going to give me a lick. They were not trained, one to be generous and one not to be generous. 
There's jealousy in little children. There's just a lot of things we're born with. We call the concupiscence of the original sin. Everybody tells you doesn't exist. <laughs> oh, does it exist? That's why we need to be baptized. That's why we need our Lord. We need the Eucharist. You know, Don Bosco had this dream one night. And it was a vision, he called them dreams. And he saw this big ship with the Holy Father at the wheel and a big hole in the ship. And a lot of these little ships were going off the big ship and rowing around by themselves. And then the ship was in a terrible storm. And all of a sudden, out of the ocean came two pillars. And on the top of one pillar was the Eucharist, and the top of the other pillar, Our Lady. And then the ship began to straighten up. I think we're in those times right now. We have another call. Hello? Hi, Mother Angelica. Hi, where are you from? Uh, my name is Joan. I'm from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, outside. Oh, what is your question? My question um, was about something you were speaking about earlier about hell. Um, I was wondering if you have any idea, and I'm sure that you do, mm. of why... The, why do the priests not give sermons on hell and purgatory anymore when it's something that so many people have no idea about anymore these days? I'm young, I'm 30, and um, people my age just look at me like I'm crazy mm -hmm. when I would even mention that, you know, oh, you know, I have to go to confession. Um, you know, if I talk about purgatory um, in a conversation, they... You know, they say to my say to me, you really think that when you die that you know something like that's going to happen to you? And I I really have to say. Did you that, ever ask him what they think is going to happen to that? <laughs> well, I I know that um, I've had a couple of conversations. Um, I'm a teacher, and I you know I taught religion, and um, I've had a couple of conversations with people about it, and um, they would say, well, I think I'm going to heaven. Just as they are. Right? Mm hmm That's right. <laughs> Do I have news for them? No, we cannot go and see God as we are because we're so faulty and we're sinners, you know. When governments provide and promote pro abortions, when churches promote sin, when they promote error, they're not, uh, many people are not going to purgatory. But to answer your question, the reason priests and ministers don't teach about <coughs> purgatory and hell is they don't believe in them anymore. They're articles of faith. They're one of the things you must believe if you're a Catholic. Since they did away with sin, then you do away with hell, and you do away with purgatory, you see. If there was a time, I believe, the devil has charged the world, the Lord called him the prince of this world, I think it's now, for this reason. Who is it that doesn't want you to believe in hell? The father of lies doesn't want you to believe in hell. He has deceived and seduced people into thinking God is so compassionate he does not put anyone in hell. That's absolutely right, but God does not put people in hell. They go there on their own because they cannot stand holiness. They can't stand goodness. They can't stand forgiveness. They're bitter and hateful inside. And the sight of an all-loving, all-holy, all-merciful God is a terror to them. So when people say there is no hell, there is no purgatory, there is no sin, they reduce mankind to that animal level. Animals will not do what men do today. They won't. 
They won't. When we do away with God, we reduce our will to feelings. We reduce our intellect to unreasonable things. And as a result, every time you open a paper, you see something more unreasonable. Was it reasonable for that man in Maine to go and kill two holy nuns and, and beat up two more? For what? Do they know? And you say there's no sin. Those women are martyrs in our age. But you tell me there is no sin. I read an article in the Birmingham paper where a little Dominique, I don't know whether she's two or three years old, maybe four, had 140 some wounds on her. A third degree burn, she had 18 slashes on her face. She had, you're telling me there's no sin? <coughs> When you see children aborted in pieces and you tell me there's no sin. You see treating the, the children treating their grandparents as if they were nothing, old and useless. You say there's no sin. How can you say there is no sin? And if you say there is a sin, or there is sin. St. John said, he who says he does not sin is a liar. You can read it in his epistle. And no liar goes to heaven. <laughs> you know, they, I think these people never read the scriptures. <coughs> never read. If someone says there is no Eucharist, it's only a symbol. Your Eucharist, I'm Eucharist, it's a lie. If they say there's no original sin, that's a lie. If they say Our Lady was just a little illiterate young girl, that's a lie. There's only one who spread lies, the father of lies. Be careful, huh? Be watchful and yet have unbelievable hope. With all the mess that's in the world, everywhere God has it in his hands. He wants to give you peace and joy, unbelievable joy, by doing a simple thing. Say, I am sorry. <coughs> Go to confession. Will you do that? Huh? Oh, you're going to feel Go out and have yourself a big pizza <laughs> <laughs> for me. And don't forget, please, put us between your gas and electric bill. February is a hard month for us, but we'll make it because of you. I don't know what we'd do without you, but we wouldn't be. I'll see you tomorrow night with a very wonderful guest. And together, we shall love Jesus always. Bye now.